Uh, my name is Nick Lord and I'm a reader in criminology at the University of Manchester in the UK and I'm very pleased today to be able to interview Mike Levy, uh, a professor of criminology from Cardiff University in the UK as part of the Oral Histories Project here in Sarajevo at the European Society of Criminology's annual conference 2018. Uh, so Mike, I think the, the first or the, the best place to start the interview would be with your early career. So I know for instance that you were an undergraduate student at Oxford. So you know, when did your interest in criminology or sociology perhaps more generally uh, emerge? Well, I studied uh, philosophy, politics and economics mm. with some sociology um, okay. and I was on a, uh, an activist group of campaigners for reform of uh, the PPE degree which was recently headlined by The Guardian as the degree that rules Britain Indeed. Um, and advocating for a full role of sociology in this to which the mm. answer in 19... Uh, 69 or 70 was um, uh, because I said you know why can't we have more sociology like in Cambridge mm -hmm. and the answer in this rational society was we don't take any notice of what happens <laughs> at the other place mm -hmm. uh, the other place being Cambridge mm -hmm. and the um, so I did some sociology as part of that but I also did development economics I did the politics of Western Europe as an mm. option, right. the politics of the US as an option, mm. as well as economics courses, and uh, and that turned out to be all quite useful mm -hmm. in my later career. But I was just interested in crime. I had no, mm -hmm. there was nothing apart from doing some reading, some Durkheim, mm. um, uh, in my undergraduate degree that that propelled me in the direction. I thought, well. I got a reasonably good degree. I'll apply to Cambridge to the, it was the last year of the diploma in criminology. Right, okay. um, and uh, because it wasn't worth a full master's in those days. And that was the early 70s? That was 1971. 71. And uh, I was accepted, they had a maximum of normally of 16 people and I was the 17th. They took one <laughs> extra. <laughs> um, you had an exception. And, um, and then after that I was uh, talking to people about white collar crime and, mm -hmm. uh, and what interested me in those days of ambiguity of the new criminology mm -hmm. and deviancy theory thinking about uh, the boundaries, mm -hmm. I thought why don't I look at a type of uh, crime, in this case bankruptcy fraud, long firm mm -hmm. fraud. Uh, which is done both by organized criminals mm. and by ordinary business people. Mm -hmm. And I could look and think about that overlap and how they were dealt with and mm -hmm. how um, in, in what would now be called routine activities theory, mm -hmm. um, uh, how business was organized to detect mm -hmm. this kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, crime and how people reacted to it. Yeah. So, so your interest then in the interface or the intersections between organised crime and what we would call white collar crime was there right from the start then uh, with your original doctoral thesis around long firm fraud. Yeah. It's continued to be a key element of your research since. So in th thinking about your doctoral research then, the, you know, the phantom capitalists and kind of this really interesting uh, concept you came up with, I mean could, could you talk more about the research you did there? Yeah, well like many PhD proposals and mm. since we're talking on this kind of ESC oral history mm -hmm. it's very important people don't always have a fully formed idea because access is a problem mm. um, as you know in your own fine mm -hmm. work um, <laughs> the um, uh, you can you can't really predict how much access you're going to get or not mm. get so I always tell my students uh, they ought to have a mini-max approach of things that they can certainly do and things that they hope to do. Mm -hmm. So if things don't go well in the hope to do list, um, then they can, uh, there's some things that they can fall back on. Mm -hmm. sure. And in my case that was thinking about the history of legislation mm -hmm. against this phenomenon, uh, looking at historical information mm. about how uh, historical cases about how the crimes were organized mm. because from an early time mm. 
I didn't like the concept of organized crime. I was always thinking, how is this crime organized? How is it reacted to? How is it detected? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and um, so, I th uh, so I had kind of, if you like, that as my fallback. And then um, I thought, well, it'd be interesting to look at how this is policed mm. um, by the credit card, but by uh, business intelligence agencies, mm -hmm. because how do you know that something is going to be a fraud? Mm -hmm. you, you want to try and prevent it. So I looked at the commercial prevention, mm -hmm. um, and I also looked at uh, policing. I thought, well, how am I going to get access to the police? Mm -hmm. uh, I got access to the the courts in the Old Bailey, um, the London Central Criminal Court, mm -hmm. uh, through uh, my ex-supervisor in Cambridge, um, and uh, so I, I had access to past cases, which was a very laborious process. Um, but I also met at a Cambridge Criminology Conference a superintendent from the Fraud Squad um, who I was chatting to just out of friendly. I didn't know who he was, but he was on his own and I was chatting to him. And, um, and he turned out to be a superintendent in the Metropolitan Police. And from there he kind of facilitated my, uh, my access uh, to the police. Um, and when that was over, I mean, I, I looked at the business intelligence systems, how they picked up or didn't pick up fraud risks, um, which was then not something that criminologists sure. do. Yeah. Um, I looked at how it was policed. I looked at how the courts dealt with it. I sat mm -hmm. in on, on a couple of cases. I worked as a defense lawyer's clerk yeah, in a right. fraud case mm -hmm. where uh, my client was asked if he wanted to uh, give evidence for the prosecution and mm -hmm. was told by one of his co-defendants that they would shoot him if he did, so he decided not to. Right. Um, and the, yeah, so I, I looked at the control side and I thought, why don't I try and interview some offenders? Mm -hmm. And in a way, I was lucky they weren't. There'd been a big anti corruption drive. Some of the fraudsters who had been paying off the mm -hmm. cops mm -hmm. were in jail. Um, and after. Laurie Taylor and Stan Cohen's book Psychological mm -hmm. Survival, mm -hmm. there was a freeze on anybody doing interviews in prison and I was uh, lucky enough to be the first person allowed in jail mm -hmm. to interview mm -hmm. um, offenders and I also interviewed some people on the, on the outside. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm pleased you mentioned, mentioned methodology, actually, because I remember when I was a PhD student of yours back in, in Cardiff over 10 years ago now, and one of the really interesting bits of the, the Phantom Capitalist book was the methodological, methodological appendix at the end where you detail that process of trying to speak to different actors from different areas, all related to the, the issue of long-firm fraud, in order to try and understand their, their position, so the, the, kind of the concept of Fishtayen. And is that something which has been relevant for your research since, trying to understand different perspectives to corroborate and validate these qualitative insights that we gather through our research? Uh, yes, and I still think that's the, uh, that's the right way. It's one way of, um, I suppose, complexifying the portrait. You know, there's a lot of criminological work that looks at, uh, you know, binary mm -hmm. ways in which we treat people, criminals, not criminals, mm -hmm. deviants, not deviants. Mm -hmm. It's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So understanding the way that... Um, criminal careers develop or don't develop, um, understanding the way in which you know, some people get drawn into a formal social control net mm -hmm. and others don't. Mm -hmm. um, that's an important part, but also as a way of, of seeing whether police perspectives are shared by offenders mm -hmm. um, or vice versa, uh, or whether there's a significant difference you then have the problem of working well who do you believe or perhaps they are both mm -hmm. telling the truth as they see it sure. um, mm. that's an interesting question how, how do we determine which is the more plausible account with different research perspectives I mean that, I guess that's something you've considered as well in your research yeah I don't think there's any objective way of uh, mm -hmm. doing that uh, 
of course, in a sense, if you were doing it as a forensic um, investigator, you might have, particularly in the case of, uh, wh whether it's in the case of fraud or money laundering, or whether it's the case of you, you have um, surveillance cameras and stuff, mm -hmm. you might look for uh, hard data that corroborate mm -hmm. one story more than mm -hmm. another. But it is a problem that, I mean, I'm a fan of of interviewing and and first day and perspective. But you have to also accept that people may not properly understand why they do things. Mm, sure. Um, and you know, I know I don't about my own motivation. Yeah. So why should we expect uh, uh, criminals uniquely or cops uniquely? Um, yeah. to, to understand why they do things. That's a really good point. And, and just continuing the methodology theme, you mentioned as part of your doctoral research the fortuitous uh, connections that you came across uh, and therefore you're able to snowball from there on to speak to more people in the area. And that's a theme which is quite common in white collar crime and corporate crime research in that it's very difficult to gain access to those elite, whether offenders or those involved in crime control. Uh, so do you think this, in terms of the data available to us as white collar crime researchers, is it, is it inevitable that we have to pursue these more qualitative uh, snowballing approaches or are there alternatives there? Well, it depends on also on the culture of the country mm -hmm. and its relationships mm -hmm. um, with research. Mm -hmm. I think the Netherlands is probably the most progressive mm -hmm. from this point of view. Mm -hmm. um, many Latin countries are the opposite. Um, and we should not forget, um, from a southern criminology perspective, that you know in Africa, um, yeah. uh, still criminal statistics are sometimes seen, uh, and in Arab countries, mm. as state secrets, and in China. So you can't, um, you know, you may adopt uh, what the Chinese would call Guangxi mm. uh, networking to yeah. to get. Uh, information mm -hmm. and, and then access to people but when it comes to using it formally particularly using consent in ethics mm -hmm. uh, forms etc that then becomes a problematic feature which it wasn't in my day because mm -hmm. I was actually concerned about the ethical dimensions of what I did mm -hmm. but there were no consent forms yeah. that you had to give um, people and still you know you're having a conversation um, with people mm -hmm. uh, before you get uh, yeah. before you approach people mm -hmm. for access a lot of these things are not really allowed for in formalistic psychologistic mm -hmm. research design mm -hmm. issues yeah yeah very true okay good so your PhD then that was at Southampton University yeah Is that right and, and then out thereafter you quickly uh, took up a position in Cardiff uh, was that the end of the 70s? No, no, in, the 80s, in, so? in 1975, before, you finished w where, where, before I finished, yeah. um, I was asked at my interview, um, so, um, I mean, it was a rare thing in those yeah. days for people to have PhDs and mm. you could be appointed without one. Mm -hmm. um, um, I was John Martin's first successful PhD student in his 50s. Um, <laughs> and the... Um, but I, was, I remember being asked at my interview, so, yeah, um, is your PhD just about finished? I said, mm. yeah, very close. <laughs> um, well, in fact, it took me four years. So yeah. was that the criminal offence of obtaining a pecuniary advantage by deception? <laughs> um, no, because I persuaded myself that, mm. uh, like a white-collar criminal does, uh, that it was almost finished. But nobody told me to stop. and. My PhD was actually 240,000 words, mm -hmm. uh, 730 pages mm. or so, yeah, uh, because nobody told me to stop. And this yeah. was before the invention of computers. So there was no mechanized way of telling how much you, sure. you'd written. Wow. Yeah. And so, so since, you, since you arrived in Cardiff then, uh, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the research that you've been involved in over that period, so since 1975 uh, to the present day, quite a, a large research program. Yeah, well, that's 43 years mm. I've been in Cardiff mm -hmm. University yeah. uh, on the staff. The, um, the 
There's a variety of projects. Most of them are on business crime or organized crime. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, business crime can be crimes against business or crimes by business. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been involved in both. Mm -hmm. Some of the issues have looked, uh, for example, I was appointed by the Royal Commission on Criminal Justice to look at the investigation, prosecution and trial of serious fraud. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of them have been on, say, proceeds of crime investigation, mm -hmm. uh, confiscation. Uh, some of them, I invented the corporate fraud survey mm -hmm. in 1985. Uh, in a home office project. So I'd say those are quite sort of revolutionary in way pieces, of, particularly in a place like the UK, where mm -hmm. unlike the continental Europe, um, court cases are not routinely available mm -hmm. for, for people to work with. Mm -hmm. And so you have to negotiate access mm -hmm. um, every time. Uh, then I've done other work on, for example, um, in the late 80s, I, after a big Brinks map go mm -hmm. bullion robbery mm -hmm. of 30 million pounds, um, I was asked to do a review of bankers' responsibilities to the police mm -hmm. and vice versa because <laughs> there was no report mm -hmm. uh, of suspicion, even though the laundering took a long time. Mm -hmm. But there was no laundering legislation then. Yeah. So I was asked to do this report and that snowballed into other projects looking at how people reported, how they developed suspicions of money laundering, whether they reported or not, mm -hmm. and what were the effects of those reports. Mm -hmm. And um, without being too vain, I mean, a lot of that research has never really been repeated anywhere mm -hmm. else. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, but it's very important because, you know, lawyers emphasize, you know, what, uh, what crime should people be required to report on? Mm -hmm. But then you might say, well, what's the point of reporting if nothing happens to the reports? Mm -hmm. So this idea of process of mm -hmm. thinking through from suspicion to, um, to reporting, mm -hmm. to investigation, to either criminal prosecution or civil or regulatory mm -hmm. sanctioning and what are the impacts of that yeah. is something I've tried to do in many different mm -hmm. projects over the years. Sure, uh, and much of your research has been quite uh, kind of impact driven as well so you've been able to inform policy and practice of UK authorities and beyond across Europe and, and globally as well. So do you think having some kind of applied aspect to our research is important in, in what the, area, the area of white-collar crime and fraud? Um, well, it was important to me. I don't think it's important to everybody. You know, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong mm -hmm. in doing, if you like, pure sociological or, or oppositional activist stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the criminology is a broad yeah. uh, uh, subject. Everybody has a difference. So it's perfectly okay with me if people want to study uh, environmental activism mm -hmm. uh, that's a uh, even if they're not having an impact on mm -hmm. how, how you know they hope to um, but I would say some of the work that I've had that has had an influence mm -hmm. has been because people wanted it to mm -hmm. it's naive to think mm -hmm. that just because you have good evidence people mm -hmm. will always act on it sure. um, and that is a fundamental uh, theory flaw in the notion of impact that it's purely driven by the evidence mm -hmm. uh, we know from studies of drug control mm -hmm. that that is not the case mm -hmm. um, and it's it, so it's a question of politics but if you can provide good evidence and people are willing to reappraise what they're doing mm -hmm then yeah. that is a, a fortunate form of impact. And I've been fortunate with some of the work that I've done and less fortunate in others. I mean, and, and others are more ambiguous, like, for example, the work we did looking at what has been the impact of anti-money laundering, mm -hmm. very difficult analytically mm -hmm. yeah. issue. Um, uh, that did push the authorities into including some real world impacts in their evaluations mm -hmm. but it's a very difficult working process mm -hmm. and they want to keep the system going mm -hmm. so you have to be 
um, aware uh, that you may not be successful, doesn't matter whether you've got a history of being successful mm -hmm. or, or deluding yourself that you're successful mm -hmm. um, or not. Mm -hmm. You know, politics in the final analysis and institutional interests Mm -hmm. are um, sometimes more important than evidence. Yeah, sure. Good. Uh, and just continuing that theme then, uh, around the impact that you've had, what do you think some of the biggest achievements are that you've had in terms of your contribution on the one hand to policy and practice but also to the production of knowledge and the literature, uh, the criminological literature? Um, I think you know, there's an advantage in being first in mm. in an area. Um, the um, so I, I would say that I probably had an influence in in making the kind of white collar business crime area um, more understandable to people, more ambiguous than a pure ideological. Mm -hmm theory would generate um, because people don't always act in their own interests um, and so um, the kind of Marxism theories that were current when I started uh, have to be moderated in the face of, um, of people's perceptions of the process. Um, I would say that the, the collection of data which I've done on, mm. say, sentencing and policing mm. yeah, and sure. uh, stuff, and the amount of resourcing of this uh, and the way that it is deployed mm. has helped people to to think in a, um, a more systematic way mm -hmm. about what they're doing. Mm. But, you know, that's a very partial... Uh, influence likewise the work on the organization of crime mm -hmm. trying to get people to rethink yeah. uh, instead of organized not organized or mm -hmm. disorganized mm -hmm. how organized mm -hmm. um, and thinking of it as a kind of problem oriented mm -hmm. policing issue that then uh, that's had a bit of an impact but I wouldn't say I've had a huge <laughs> impact on criminology generally. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you do yourself a disservice, Mark. You know, your research has been in very influential, for instance, in my own uh, career, as you mentioned, about how crimes are organized, white collar crimes, uh, and so on. So, you know, but as my mother would say, I've got a lot to be modest about. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, you know, in that time as well, you know, you've quite an extensive research uh, career. What are some of the biggest challenges that you faced in carrying out research in academia, uh, you know, European criminology. Are there any particular challenges that, that you've encountered in that time? Um, almost every project I've done has been a challenge. Right. Um, there's very little that I've done uh, that was easy. <laughs> um, almost uh, um, in the early days, actually, the anti-money laundering stuff was because nobody most of the areas that I've worked in have been areas nobody, I mean, without being too kind of uh, romantic about it, uh, no, no man has ever trodden before. Um, the, uh, and that has advantages and disadvantages. You've got advantages, people are genuinely curious, they've not seen people with an interest in this before. And I try to be in, uh, I, I am interested in them and in the way that they think and behave. Mm -hmm. And I hope that comes across mm -hmm. to them and is one reason why I get better cooperation. Um, but, you know, if I was doing work on, say, police corruption in Mexico, yeah. uh, then you have to understand that's not such an easy thing mm -hmm. to get people's collaboration mm -hmm. uh, in. So the, but I've, uh, in general, the problems are you know, how do you get people's cooperation? Um, how do you make sure that they're, they're going to really cooperate as mm. opposed to just say they will? Yeah. Uh, and I would say that's actually got harder. The more people mm. in the field mm -hmm. and the more mediatized the process mm. gets, the harder mm -hmm. uh, it gets. And, uh, you know, the UK is quite a kind of secrecy-oriented <laughs> uh, society. Uh, 
you know because of your work with freedom of information mm -hmm. requests and stuff mm -hmm. yeah people don't re often don't respond you've got a limited time as a researcher mm -hmm. they know yeah. they can outlast you so all they have to do is to cooperate very slowly mm -hmm. uh, and your time will run out um, and uh, you know the advantage I have is that sometimes I, I'm not so desperate for time but mm -hmm. you have to realize it's in your own time mm -hmm as well mm -hmm. uh, so time limited projects where you need people's cooperation yeah. are always a problem mm -hmm. um, you know the, the politics of research have become more mm -hmm. complicated as politicians um, arguably are sometimes less interested in doing a good job for society than mm -hmm. in doing a good job for their careers mm -hmm. um, uh, and as police chiefs, likewise. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that my research was earlier in the early years because there was more developed public culture mm. of doing a good job for society, yeah. um, and that was a, an ally. Now mm. it's a kind of harder thing. People mm -hmm. are, you know, what could I gain or lose yeah. from this? Mm -hmm. And so that becomes more of a challenge to allay people's fears. Mm -hmm. So even though I've got a, a track record of, of, of behaving reasonably, uh, the turnover of people means they might not know that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, working out that reassurance mm -hmm. uh, mm. is, is, remains a perpetual challenge mm -hmm. even if you're as old. Yeah. Uh, and experienced as I am. Yeah, well I must admit having you by my side in many of those conversations we've had at the start of projects has been very beneficial given that your name is often well known in the sphere of economic crime and so on. Uh, so yeah, I can certainly uh, agree with you there. So we've mentioned the UK quite a few times, obviously we're both based uh, in the UK, in England and Wales. So thinking about criminology in the UK, you know, how has that changed over the time since you've been involved uh, say at Cardiff or before then are there any particular features you think of UK based criminology or it's grown enormously mm. I mean when I was yeah. appointed there were two lectureships in criminology mm -hmm. in the whole of the UK mm. uh, that year mm -hmm. and uh, if I hadn't got the job at Cardiff which was my first interview yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, then I probably wouldn't have been an academic at all because mm. you know I would have had to have done the, uh, you know, as a jobbing researcher, whatever research was around, on probation, on mm, yeah. uh, prisons or whatever, I wasn't that interested in that mm. um, and I probably wasn't any better at that <laughs> than anybody else. Mm. So I probably would have quit and maybe I would have been a multimillionaire uh, Indeed, merchant yeah. banker or you could have been interviewing me in jail. Yeah, but, the, um, uh, but the... Um, Criminology has, has grown, I mean, it's exploded mm -hmm. um, since the late 80s. Um, there are now lots of posts, you know, I wonder mm -hmm. uh, how uh, the subject can mm -hmm. be sustained, actually. But, the, but it has grown, people are doing a huge, more, much more diverse mm -hmm. range of things. There are more people doing white collar and organized crime projects but still a tiny proportion of the whole. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the same applies to continental Europe. Mm -hmm. um, although I would say there are more people doing sophisticated stuff in European countries mm -hmm. than, than there are with the exception of mm -hmm. you and a couple of others in the, in the UK mm -hmm. and more, far more so than in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, one of the ways I would think things have changed is that almost kind of Europe has taken over from the US mm -hmm. in the spheres of organized crime, and white collar mm -hmm. crime. Uh, so there's more sophisticated stuff being mm -hmm. done yeah. uh, in Europe than there often is in, mm -hmm. the, in, in the US. Yeah, I mean, you, that was my next question, the role of criminology in Europe and white collar crime research in particular, uh, and how any differences that may exist with the US where traditionally white collar crime research was uh, at the forefront with the original research of Sutherland and Ross and so on. Uh, but yeah, I think you've, you know, you've answered that. Are, are there any other... Yeah, may, maybe just one point. Uh, I mean, there are, there are a lot of people working on regulation stuff. Mm in the UK and, yes. and the US and Europe. 
that is are not part of criminology mm -hmm. often, um, but the people are still concentrating um, in some cases on ideological mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, you know, health and safety at work, which is a very important mm -hmm. area, yeah. you know, uh, or environmental offences. Mm -hmm. um, are still very important and have been dealt with a lot. Financial services crime is much less mm -hmm. dealt with yeah. um, <laughs> and remains you know, a very difficult area to access. Yeah. And why do you think that is then? Because of those difficulties around access? Because you can data. get data from regulatory agencies mm -hmm. or from you know, death. I mean, the, the, the data issues are easier mm. um, or less difficult. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and you can speak to workers, and you can speak to uh, employers, and uh, and stuff easier in the kind of general mm -hmm. way. Uh, getting access to financial services personnel mm -hmm. sure. uh, is is a lot tougher. Mm -hmm. And and you mentioned this briefly previously, but how do you think that compares with Europe more broadly? So I know from my own research in Germany and the Netherlands, accessing data seems to be much more straightforward. Where this a much higher level of cooperation with the authorities, with academic and scientific researchers. They're much more open and, and in some cases obliged to assist where possible. Whereas in the UK we often have difficulties gaining those kind of data yeah. and that kind of access. Yeah, it's not just Germany and the Netherlands, also Scandinavia, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we should remember. I think there's a sense in which the sort of public authorities mm. um, have more kind of, first, first of all, court and prosecution records are publicly accessible in ways that they're not in mm. the UK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, even when I was a PhD student, um, you know, working out how, how you get uh, court records, even mm. in a privileged position of access, w was very difficult. Um, so I think it's partly a, 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 a mindset, mm. it's partly about legal requirements, it's partly the culture of, uh, in Germany and Netherlands, most people are working from law faculties. Mm -hmm. They've already got developments. Often they're dealing with their own ex-students mm -hmm. or <laughs> adjunct professors. Yeah. Uh, speaking to the uh, people involved in the Yale White Collar Crime yeah. Project in the mm -hmm. 1980s in the US, if it hadn't been at Yale, mm -hmm. Uh, they would never have got access right. uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of the judges and the prosecutors mm -hmm. were Yale graduates yeah. mm -hmm. and so they could uh, you know, do their networking mm -hmm. through prestige. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we have to think about uh, these elements of, of culture and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and access. You know, I have... Uh, enabled other people including yourself mm. to get access to stuff that they would have found much more mm -hmm. more difficult it's partly because i do a lot of professional mm -hmm. talks to to practitioners yeah, yeah. and therefore i'm known if i was just writing in academic journals mm. uh, however meritorious mm -hmm. that is uh, then they wouldn't know about that stuff mm -hmm. yeah yeah very true Indeed. And so, as we're at the ESC annual conference, uh, conference Mike, it, you know, it's, I think it's important that we discuss your role uh, with, within the European Society of Criminology uh, over the years. So, I mean, could you tell us a bit about when you first got involved with the ESC and how things have progressed since that time? I, I was doing European work before the ESC mm -hmm. was founded. Mm -hmm. ESC was founded in, in 2000, uh, the first marvellous conference in Lausanne. Thanks to Martin Kilias and uh, uh, other d d Dutch scholars, mm -hmm. for example, uh, Junger Tass, uh, and a variety of people who, who got it together. But I had tried to do uh, research in, uh, uh, for example, on EU fraud mm -hmm. um, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember we had some very productive meetings in the Bundeskriminalamt right, okay. and I have to say that as a, the son of a, a concentration camp survivor mm -hmm. it made me feel very strange going inside the electronic gates mm. in Wiesbaden. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, but we tried to do that before. So I was a Europhile, I am a Europhile mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
I speak French reasonably fluently and a smattering of a few words of other European languages. Uh, so I was very happy to be in the founding board um, as one of the few Brits who were interested in, mm -hmm. in European yeah. criminology and already worked with Dutch uh, criminologists. Um, I was very happy to be part of, uh, of that and uh, from small beginnings it's now uh, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Uh, uh, conference and I think it, it's the embodiment of this uh, mm -hmm. freedom to travel mm. yeah. um, uh, which uh, How long? yeah <laughs> at least for the moment uh, and the yeah here in Sarajevo it's a bit harder for Sarajevo for Bosnians mm. but the um, but it, it's it's been an important thing to to try and develop and mm -hmm. you know one of the interesting things uh, as you know as a, a leading white collar crime scholar yourself um, the there's a lot more s serious white collar crime research mm -hmm. and a lot more serious organized crime research and a lot more serious money laundering research mm -hmm. in Europe than anywhere else in the world mm -hmm. and um, you know and that's a great thing for people to kind of get together and and have proper discussions yeah. <coughs> about their mm -hmm. disciplines um, and um, and more generally in every sphere of activity there's mm -hmm. been an explosion of European interest helped by being in nice places mm. uh, like but Cardiff, like Cardiff um, especially like Cardiff that's in Wales <laughs> that's in the UK the um, the in nice places, but even in not such wonderful places, there's still very good attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, because people like the experience, mm -hmm. and um, and long may it remain. So European criminology is developed in diverse ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, the old days of my era, in which you could read everything that had been written mm -hmm. on the subject. Yeah. Um, not that I did, but you could, <laughs> um, and uh, you, you could read all this, everything that had been written about the subject. That's very long gone, so we're much more kind of specialised, atomised mm -hmm. now, and I think that's a problem in, in Europe, in the US, yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so as a, a very elder statesman uh, now, the... Um, Part of my job as Ian Forster put it in Howard's End is to only connect and the so to think about what are the crossover between different areas of the mm -hmm. discipline and to look for mm -hmm. continuities to try and reach out to people who are not initially interested in your stuff mm -hmm. as to why they should that's not a very successful thing mm -hmm. to do. And so still, most people in most places uh, are not that interested in white-collar crime. They might or might not cover it in their criminology yeah. Uh, yeah. courses. Um, and, but there's probably not got nobody researching it at mm -hmm. a serious level. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, is that a problem? Not necessarily, but uh, attempts to um, get ordinary criminologist to, for, in a non-negative mm. way uh, interested in white collar crime research have been uh, have, have met with relatively little success mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's a scope if the funding agencies mm. can be aligned mm -hmm. in this way to doing more integrated or more parallel yeah. research projects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, such as people are now thinking about life course criminology mm -hmm. um, for corporations 
mm. um, and for individuals, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about more for corporations, um, to uh, think about variations in how prosecutors and regulators approach their task, mm -hmm. uh, trying to collect evidence on what is the impact mm. of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, are there variations in white collar offending in different countries mm -hmm. and in what respects? I mean, on the one hand, this is transnational activity sometimes. <laughs> you know, to what extent is it national activity? To what extent is it transnational activity? Mm -hmm. uh, do people, as cops say, do they just move to different countries to, that are more likely regulated to do bad things? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or is that a myth that people, as we know from money laundering studies, uh, mm -hmm. they often invest the money that, in places that they're comfortable mm -hmm. with, yeah. that they know mm -hmm. about. Uh, so testing those kinds of propositions as far as we are able. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's a limited extent. So it will always be a challenge. It will always be a struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, but the 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 issue, as I try to argue uh, consistently, is: do we just focus on the problems that we've got the best data for, mm -hmm. that we can do the most sophisticated statistical manipulations mm -hmm. of, or do we actually try and deal with issues that are? sociologically fascinating, culturally fascinating, and perhaps also present some of the biggest crime control problems, mm -hmm. um, you know, like uh, in many countries in the world, corruption, mm -hmm. um, you know, these are, or elite corruption, yeah. as well as ground level corruption. Mm -hmm. If it's easy to get data on ground level corruption, mm -hmm. So we need to be more innovative, and, mm -hmm. and here data science developments, um, uh, WikiLeaks, uh, the investigation, uh, investigative journalists, uh, we need to be uh, thinking about the diversity mm -hmm of sources to throw light on these dark corners. Mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah. And given now within European cr criminology we have a lot of rich data emerging at the local level and the national level in terms of case study analyses, but do you think it's uh, desirable or, or feasible to develop some kind of European dialogue or, or narrative, a true European discourse of criminology? Um, given that cultural variation? Yeah. I think there's a lot of variation within and between countries. Mm -hmm. uh, what an overriding European! Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what it, that there's anything specifically European, mm -hmm. uh, except in relation to those crimes that are against the European Union, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, or differently treated by the European Union. Mm -hmm. So, I think you know, we, the, there's it, it would be sloppy, in my opinion. Um, to think about this as specifically European problem. There may be dimensions of this in Africa, like mm. toxic waste dumping, um, uh, like the laundering in Europe of proceeds of grand corruption. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm not sure there's anything specifically European, mm. but if you look at how you, it, Europe has tried to regulate those issues, mm. you could say, well, what is the impact of specifically European regulation mm -hmm. on those yeah. phenomena yeah. and to describe and try and account for that specific mm -hmm. European regulation in terms of lawmaking, rulemaking, political compromises in the creation of the European Public Prosecutor's Office, mm -hmm. things like that yeah. do have a specific mm -hmm. European dimension. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we may say, well, we can't get access, we can't do everywhere, mm -hmm. so we're going to focus on European things. and through people working together in the ESC and, ever, and otherwise, uh, we can develop relationships to do things comparatively in a European way, mm -hmm. hopefully even post-Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, then those are, I think, reasonable goals. Mm -hmm. Good. And, you know, it's important to try and think about the uh, opportunities for pan-European, not the whole of Europe, yeah. Because there's too many countries, you know, 28 countries. Mm. I know from doing European projects for the Commission, uh, there's not enough funding or time mm. for big projects in all countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do you do a kind of thin and light mm -hmm. 
project, yeah. uh, which as you can see from my body, <laughs> I'm not big on things <laughs> like. light. Um, but the projects, or, or, or do you try and do some more intensive things, mm -hmm. in which case think about why you are picking those countries, mm -hmm. uh, it's partly a convenient sample of which countries could cooperate. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think there's a, a, a good future if, if funding agencies can be persuaded to think in a not so national way and can be persuaded to think there might be benefits not just of looking at uh, crime control in your country mm -hmm. but what we might learn from other countries mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and in the case of British uh, politicians not, not just from America mm. um, uh, then that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, in return, I would say that the work that you, Wim Hoisman, and other uh, uh, scholars, Judith Van Ert, for example, uh, have been doing in uh, developing a European organizational crime and white collar crime uh, is a very important for the future because uh, unless the next gen, I, I will uh, at some stage be bowing out graciously or not. And the, um, uh, as the comedian Bob Monkhouse once said, I'd like to die in my bed peacefully like my father, not screaming and kicking and terrified like his passengers. <laughs> um, and the, um, you know, so the, uh, when I bow out, it's very important that the next generation, you, Vim Hoisman, etc., take over and are able to to develop this because uh, the longevity of scholarship is not as great as we would like to mm -hmm. fool ourselves through techniques of neutralization <laughs> uh, into believing and uh, and so this is a developing process so you need to mm -hmm. keep certain kinds of flames and ways of thinking um, alive and uh, you know I'm glad that people like yourself um, are uh, are going to be around uh, for many years to to help us think through the and also to give the kind of long durée mm. uh, perspective that I have a bit, as somebody who's been working in cognate fields okay um, white collar crime organized crime mm -hmm. terrorism mm -hmm. money laundering mm -hmm. corruption yeah. cyber crime <laughs> it's already a lot um, <laughs> The, but they're cognate fields for 43 years. So I have a, a sense of the evolution of these as social problems, mm -hmm. what the drivers of these as social problems mm -hmm. are, uh, and of the way that, in which we react. And we're really back to Sutherland's. Mm -hmm. Criminology is a study of the processes of making laws, of breaking laws, mm -hmm. and society's reaction towards the breaking of laws. Now, I've tried to... Uh, do this in the several fields mm -hmm. uh, that I've worked in uh, there are many others but it's that sense of the dynamics of crime control that that people working at a point in time very often miss because people are thinking you know politicians don't want to know that something has been tried before <laughs> you know because everybody wants to create something new mm -hmm. So they don't want to know it didn't work. Mm. Um, they didn't, you know, they, they want to try it because it's their project and it's their stuff. So part of uh, the importance of historically informed uh, uh, criminology is to, um, is to emphasize, well, what we know is not just what was done over the last two years, but over some longer period and to, to help persuade people that just passing laws by itself mm -hmm. has relatively little effect. Mm -hmm. If they're not implemented, and if they're not implemented and regulated on the ground, uh, as I once said when reviewing some work for the Home Office um, on strategies of organized crime policing, what is the point of having a strategy if you have no mechanism from, for getting from here to there. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to connect up uh, the grander schemes mm -hmm. to the life on the ground. Mm -hmm.
and uh, if I have a legacy at all, which is not at all certain, uh, other than this film, uh, which may be produced on technology that itself will become obsolete, um, th if I have a legacy at all, uh, then that is what I would like it to be. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Mike.